All right, welcome back. Come on in, have a seat. Welcome back to CS125. So, today we're gonna have a fun day together. We're gonna do some recursion problems. Can I talk up here? Um, we're gonna do some more practice with recursion. We're gonna talk a little bit at the end about the project fair. It's November, so we are into our third month together, which is very exciting. Um, you get a little bit of a break this month with Thanksgiving. Um, I want to start off uh, with a mixture of good and bad news. It's mostly good news, actually. Um, so the first piece of good news, uh, you guys did well in the midterm. Congratulations. It was good. Um, I will post some summary statistics later. We have a couple of people that haven't taken it yet, so please don't discuss it on the forum or amongst yourselves. Um, we actually have someone taking it on Monday because they were out of town this week. So please uh, don't talk about it yet. We will go over the problems together next week on Wednesday once everybody has finished it. But until then, uh, but again, the scores were quite good. Uh, I'm impressed. So, you know, un un that's sort of good news for you, maybe also bad news, because um, you keep showing us how much you guys can do. And when you do that, we think, what else can they do? Um, and so we have a fantastic new MP that we're developing for you guys to uh, dig your teeth into from now until Thanksgiving. Uh, this is new. Um, it's, the concepts are not new. We've always had an MP on recursion, but the content is new. There's some new challenges on this MP. Um, I think you guys are gonna love it. I think it's a very, very cool MP. Um, it is going to be a little bit of a challenge. And I think that's good, because you guys are up for it. Something like 30 or 40 percent of the class has earned 100 on all of the MPs. All of them. And that's even the people that, you know, started on time and got the early deadline points. I think if you include the 90s, it's even higher than that. So this MP is designed to, to push you a little bit, right? You have a break at the end of it, you get to Thanksgiving. Um, but it will be a lot of fun. It's a very, very cool MP. It introduces some new ideas, very connected with what we've done already. You get a chance to use some built-in Java data structures like lists and also use recursion to do some graph exploration. Very, very cool. The bad news is we're not done with it. And so we won't actually release this until Monday. It's new, we're putting the, somebody is happy about that. Um, hold on, I'll get there. Um, we are putting the finishing touches on it. Um, we will have it out Monday. We're gonna have people look at it and test it. We're kind of thinking about difficulty, making sure the write-up is perfect. Um, you know, again, when we, when we develop one of these new MPs, it's a lot of work. A couple of my course developers, Bailey and Ben, have done a fantastic job on this, put a lot of time and effort into it. It's almost to the finish line, but, you know, we thought, let's hold it for a couple more days and try to make sure it's perfect before we let you at it. So, the good news is, for the first time since the end of August, you guys have a weekend off without an MP, without homework, without a midterm to study for. Um, so I hope you enjoy that, a little bit of a break, um, because once you get into MP5, hopefully that little bit of rest will pay off. And, you know, we still have a lot to do in the class. So I think this is a good point for you guys to pause, take a breath, get a little bit of extra sleep, um, and then, you know, come back ready to rock on Monday for a new MP and for, you know, like six more weeks of fun, exciting material. I guess we're really, you know, I, I just want to say this because I am excited about it. It's, it's difficult for us because we're like, oh my gosh, we, you know, we're doing so much with you. You guys are responding so well. You're working so hard. You're learning so much. That inspires us to do more stuff, right? And I'm so excited that we have as much time together as we do um, because you guys are really sort of pushing the envelope in terms of what's possible with this class. We've never done some of the things we're doing this semester with other courses. You guys are capable of it, clearly. You're showing that, us to, you're showing that to us every day. Okay, so what are we gonna talk about today? We're gonna go back and talk about trees again. Some of this is gonna be a review from last time. I think it's worth reiterating. We'll do a few more examples. This is one of those concepts that I want you to see a couple of times. Today's homework problem is your first chance to practice with this. Um, we will kind of actually do a variant of that you know, together. Um, but the data structure we're going to be working with, where you guys are going to be using on a lot of your recursion homework problems, is this thing called a tree, right? Um, 
and a tree consists of a series of nodes that are linked together. The rules are a parent can have multiple children, children only have one parent. And so that produces this hierarchical data structure um, where I can start at a parent, I can walk down the tree. We introduce some terminology to talk about trees, so we have a, uh, every node can be both a parent and a child, but we can talk about a parent in relationship to the children that are underneath it, that descend from it, that have it as a parent. And for every node in the tree except for one, it has a single parent, right? So it's a single link upward. Um, the top of the tree uh, we refer to as the root. That's the only node in the tree that does not have a parent. Um, our tree data, our tree class that we're gonna be working with, you guys will be using on the homework problems, only stores a reference to that one node because starting with that node, I can find every other node in the tree. This is sort of like what we did on linked lists where our list class only stored the start, it only stored a reference to the start of the list. By walking the list, I can find every other item. By walking the tree, I can find every other node. Walking a tree is a little bit more complicated than walking a list because nodes can have multiple children. This is a great place uh, to use recursion. Nodes at the bottom of the tree that don't have any children are leaf nodes. In a lot of our recursive algorithms, the leaf nodes represent a base case. That's the point where we've broken down the problem so much that it's gotten so small, we've hit a leaf node, and now we're actually gonna start to assemble our solution by moving back up the tree. So a lot of our recursive algorithms that we run on trees, we essentially make the problem smaller, smaller, smaller as we go down. Once we reach a leaf node, we've hit a base case, and then we start going, returning back and assembling the solution to larger and larger problems as we go back up the tree. Okay, talked about level and depth. These are just, you know, review of tree terminology. How deep is the tree? Um, in this case, I have a tree that's of depth three. It's the maximum number of references I have to follow to get from the root node to any leaf node. All right, great, so updated on terminology. So we started, so we, we showed that, you know, obviously I can, I can count nodes in the tree iteratively, but node counting was one of the first places where we decided, let's try to apply a recursive algorithm. Let's try to apply uh, recursion, partly because, and I don't have the slides up for this again, but a tree is a recursive data structure. Every, for every node in the tree, if it has children, every subtree from that node, or every sort of, if I take the right, if I follow the reference to the right child and I follow a reference to the left child, each of those I can consider as the root of another tree. So I can take this tree and I can break it down step by step into smaller and smaller and smaller trees until I finally get to a leaf node, at which point I have a tree of size one. That's a tree. Trees of size one are typically very easy to work with. And so a lot of times, like I said, when we write recursive algorithms, we recurse down the tree until we get to the leaves and then we start to assemble a solution going back up. So let's talk about this with counting. So if I wanted to count the number of nodes in this simple binary tree, and I'm starting from the root node, I'm gonna apply this recursive strategy, and you're gonna see this a lot when you write recursive algorithms. I have to make the problem smaller. So I don't wanna count the whole tree, and said I'm gonna say, well, Counting the whole tree is too much work, so I'm gonna split this into smaller pieces. Instead, I'll just count the left subtree and the right subtree separately. And then I know how to combine those results together. So this is another property that the types of algorithms that we run on trees have to have. You might think, and we'll talk about this more next week, but you might start to think about cases where this doesn't hold. So in what case would it be difficult or impossible to combine results from two subproblems together. When I have a problem like this, it's said to have optimal structure, but there are not every problem has this. So there are certain computations where if I compute a result for half the data and I compute a result for the other half the data, I can't combine them together. There are lots of cases where I can. In this case, I can. I just add them, so I said to, to say, Okay, if I know the size of my right subtree and I know the size of my left subtree, I add those two results together, and then I add myself. And now I know the size of the tree rooted at me. But how am I, am I going to compute the size of my right subtree and my left subtree? It seems like I've just created another problem. 
Well, I have created another problem, but that problem is smaller than the problem I started with. Because my right subtree and my left subtree, by construction, are smaller than the entire tree. And so now I've got two smaller problems to solve. And if I continue to do that, eventually I get to a problem that has size one, where I'm counting one node. I get to a leaf. How many nodes are in a tree that has no children? It's as easy. So at some point when I recurse, I have to reach a case that I'm actually going to solve. When I write recursive algorithms, a lot of times when I implement them, a lot of times I want that to be the first thing in my recursive function. It helps me make sure that there is a point at which I'm going to solve the problem. I can't just keep recursing over and over again. If I do that, my program will crash. It's never gonna stop. So at some point, if I make the problem smaller and smaller and smaller, I have to be recursing towards a problem I can solve. In this case, the problem that I can solve is if both of my children are null. Then I know the size of that tree, that that size of that tree is one. Over here, I'm gonna do the same thing. Eventually, I'm gonna get to two leaf nodes. So at this point, our algorithm has descended from the root node all the way to the leaves. That's the first step in a lot of recursive algorithms that run on trees. So now we've broken the problem. Smaller pieces, smaller pieces, smaller pieces. Now I've got all these small subproblems, and I've identified a, a subproblem that's so small that I can solve it easily, which is this tree of size one. And now I start assembling the solution to the bigger problem by combining the solution to the smaller problems. So node three says, my left subtree has size one, my right subtree has size zero, I'm here as well, I'm gonna add myself in. Node 10 says, my right subtree has size one, my left subtree has size one, I'm here as well. Five now knows the answers to the smaller problems that it created. So it created one problem, which was count the number of nodes in the tree rooted at node three. The second small problem it created was count the number of nodes rooted in the tree at node 10. So now, three knows the answer, and it says to 10, it says to five, okay, I know the answer, the number of nodes in your left subtree is two, and 10 also knows the answer, it says to five, okay, the number of nodes in your right subtree is three, and now we're done. Five says, okay, I've counted my left subtree, I've counted my right subtree, and I'm gonna include myself, and I'm finished. So now I know the size of this entire tree. And this result could be part of a larger computation, so I could have just counted a subtree of a bigger tree that I didn't show you, and that bigger tree could be the subtree of something else. And so there's this beautiful self-similarity to these recursion problems that allows us to write what you'll see later is extremely elegant code. The code to count the nodes in the tree is like three lines. It's really nice. Okay. So let's actually do that, all right? So this is our binary tree class. And there's, you know, there's a certain amount of stuff that we have to provide for you to get this to work. I'm not gonna go through this carefully. We will talk about the add algorithm separately in a minute. But for now, let's just um, posit that this code does the right thing. And what it does is there's a constructor that takes a list of arguments and it adds them to the tree. It creates a tree from this list. Now, in order to do that, it uses a little bit of randomness to figure out where to put elements so that I get a balanced tree. Uh, if I don't do that, I can end up with a tree that's essentially a list. We'll talk about those later because they have some pathological properties. By the way, I just want to point that out since we just mentioned it. A list, a linked list, is a tree. It's a, it's a type of tree. It's not a very interesting tree because, so let's imagine I take a linked list and just tilt it on its side. It's a tree where every element only has a right child. When we talk about search on trees, We'll be concerned about that tree because that tree has some pathological properties that make search algorithms that can sometimes run extremely quickly on certain types of trees run extremely slowly on trees that are entirely linear. Okay, so, so I take my list of items, I add them to the tree, I create this tree with kind of a, a little bit of a random structure to it, and my goal here is to implement this size method, which I have left not completed for you. All right, so let's do this together. So a lot of times when we're gonna implement uh, functions on our tree class, what we're gonna do is we're gonna provide a public function size that takes no arguments. 
But in order for the recursion to work, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna provide a helper function here. So this helper function I'm gonna mark as private. It's not for outside use. Nobody else should be calling this. But this is gonna be called by my size function. And this function is set up so that it can be called recursively. So what does this function do? This function is gonna compute the number of nodes in the tree rooted at the node that's passed to it, right? So essentially this counts all the nodes below whatever node I pass to it. And so to compute all the nodes in the tree, what I'm gonna do, or to compute the size of the tree, what did I call this? I called it root, right, okay. I'm just gonna return the result of calling size on the root node. So again, this is a common design pattern when implementing these recursive algorithms. I essentially have kind of a wrapper function that's public, it's right up at the top there. All it does is call my recursive function on the root node. So it's just sort of a bootstrap to get things started. There's another way of doing this that we used last year that's a little bit, that has different trade-offs. I like this better, so this is what we're gonna do this time. So I have two versions of size. I have the public version that people call with no arguments. And then I have a private version that computes the size of, or the number of nodes below the node that's passed to it. And I call it on the root node. So that's gonna compute the size of the entire tree. Okay, so. Whenever we write recursive functions, the first thing we need to wanna do is identify a base case. When can I stop? When have I created a problem that's so small that I have to solve it? Yeah. What's that? Yeah, so, so when I've reached a leaf node, that was my base case for my recursive counting algorithm. How do I know that I'm in a leaf node? What's true about a leaf node? Yeah. Yeah, there's no children. How do I tell that? Eh, okay, let's, let's do, let's save that for a minute. So I can do this so that I get to a null reference, but I'm not gonna do that yet. Let's say I have a valid reference to a node. How do I know if it's a leaf? What's true about it? Yeah. <laughs> Left and right should both be null. Bingo. So let's say if current.left is equal to null and current.right is equal to null. So I've reached a leaf node. If I've reached a leaf node, how many nodes are in the tree rooted at this node? What's the answer? This is my base case. I have to solve this problem. I can't put it off anymore. I've created a problem so small that I have to know the answer, and the answer is 42, right? One. All right. There's one node in this tree. Okay, great. So I've solved my base case but I still need to add my recursive step. So if I'm not a leaf node, then I have either a left subtree or a right subtree or both, right? And so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna say, I'm gonna create this count variable, and I'll initialize it to one, that's me. And then I'll say, if, so if I have a left child, I'm gonna add the result of counting my left subtree. If I have a right child, I'm gonna add the result of counting my right subtree. And then I'm gonna return count. Okay, so the top is my base case. Turns out I actually don't even need that piece of code. You might see why. But I'd like to have that right up top so I know when I'm gonna stop. I'm stopping when I'm getting to a node that has no children. I have to reach that node. If I keep going down the tree, if, if the tree is finite size, I will reach a leaf node. So that's my base case. Otherwise, I make the problem smaller. I tear off half of it, it's my right subtree if I have one, and I compute that. And then I also tear off the other half of it, which is my left subtree, if I have one, and I incorporate that, 
and I count myself. So I take myself, count left, count right. Does this work? It does. Questions about this? Yes, we'll come, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a sec. We're, we're gonna clean this up in a minute. I'll show you how elegant this can get. Yes, Jeremy. Never mind, never mind. Other questions? Yeah, so, so the, the observation, which is a great one, is that what happens if my tree is empty? I could try this. Is there an empty constructor on this guy? No, but I think if I give it an empty list, it will still die. Oh, oh, what happened? What happened here? What happened? There's no items in the list. Some tree, sorry. My brain needs to fast forward a little bit. No items in the tree, so root is still null. Nothing ever got added to the tree. My root reference is still null, and so when I call to size, current is null, and I immediately dereference current. So I can fix this by saying if current is equal to null, return zero, so that, that defends me against that case. But this has gotten a little uglier than I wanted. Mm. Who can, so let me show you a different way to do this. All right, so I'm gonna leave that there, otherwise I'm gonna return one plus size current dot left plus size Right, dot right. That is still zero, which is good, but does it work with an actual list? Indeed. So check that out. That is beautiful. Why does this work? So when I'm doing this type of, yeah, sorry. It was not a rhetorical question, you're welcome to answer, yeah. So this is a different strategy here. And this is one of the nice way, nice things about setting up this problem this way so that I have this helper function that takes a node reference. So here what I said is that I'm gonna walk down till I get to, till I get to a leaf. But I can actually keep going. I can walk off the end of the tree until I get to a null reference. How many nodes are in a tree with a null reference? Zero. So once I walk off the end of the tree, I just return zero. So essentially what happens here, let me back this up a little bit, is that when I get down here, I actually don't stop. I call size on both of node one's children. Node one's right children, child is null. What's the size of null? Zero. Node one's left child is null. What's the size of null? Then I add node one and I go back up. The nice thing about this is, again, it produces a much more elegant version of this recursive function. Like I said, four lines, sorry. One of them's just a brace, so that doesn't really count. Yeah, questions about this? Like I said, if this is the first time you're seeing this or the first time in a while, these types of recursive functions can be extremely mysterious. Okay, so what happens if current dot left is null? What happens? So let's say I get to a node that has a null child. So I call size of null. Size gets a null reference, it says if that reference is null, it returns zero. Yeah, bingo. Yeah, so that's, that's why this is nice. It's a lot cleaner than the version that we showed you a minute ago. Other questions about this? Again, I'm just gonna pause and first allow you to admire the elegance of this recursive solution that we've come up with, but also decide. So let's, let's try to figure a little bit about what's going on here. Why don't we do this? Let's put in a, okay. So if current's null, 
I've walked out the end of the tree, so that's not particularly interesting. Otherwise, I'm gonna print current.value. And then I'll, I'll print a, let's see here. Oh, that's gonna be hard to do. So what I wanted you to see, to convince yourself of, is that this function visits every node, right? So there are four nodes in this tree, one with value one, one with value three, one with value six, one with value five. Where they are in the tree can vary a little bit. And so if I add nodes to this tree, what you're gonna see is that when I rerun this, the position of the nodes within the tree bounces around a little bit, and that's because of the randomness in my add algorithm but the result is always the same. But the function also visits every node. And we can think a little bit about, if you go through this and you look at the order in which the things are printed, you can think a little bit about what nodes are being visited in what order. Let's do something fun with this. Um, let's try to use this to, you know, uh, examine our tree. And so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to include a depth parameter to my size function. And I'm gonna use this to record where I am in the tree, how deep I am. So when I call this, I'm gonna start it at level zero. And then every time I call it again, I'm gonna call depth plus one. And this won't change the correctness of my algorithm, but it will allow me to figure out where I am. Do this, I need to be able to spell. There it is. So, and, and this actually allows us to figure out exactly where the nodes are in the tree. We can't figure out necessarily whether they're right or left children, but we can figure out um, the depth. So node one is at the root, it's the first node added, we always know that, that's always gonna be true. Node five and node three are at level one. They are the children of node zero. And then I have three leaf nodes that are down at level two, and they are eight, seven, and six. One thing I will point out, and I will just apologize for, is that I have looked repeatedly for a nice way of printing trees so that we could enjoy them together in class. I have not found one that wouldn't take up like 100 lines of the example and I think would just cause everybody's brain to explode. Um, so, you know, again, apologies for that. This is really, fundamentally, this is a two-dimensional data structure. Every data structure we've looked at so far has been one-dimensional, trees are not. Questions about this? Okay, let's do, let's do some more. So, and, and let's talk about how we've approached this problem. So, know when to stop. So we looked at two versions of count, one in which we stopped when we got to a leaf, which we identified by a node that had no children. Its right and left child were null. But there was a cleaner version of that program that we then said, we said, you know what, I can actually walk until I get to a null reference. That means I've walked off the end of a leaf node, but at that point I know that there's no more nodes in the tree and I just return zero and that allowed us to write a much cleaner formulation of, of that function. Making the problem smaller with every step. So how does our implementation do that? So calling size on my left subtree and my right subtree is computing the size of a smaller tree. So because I'm calling, I'm calling size twice, but I'm calling size twice on two smaller problems. One thing to note is that the number of, so how many nodes, once this runs, what are the, how many nodes are in the rest of the tree? Well, I've already counted myself. And so, regardless of where, even if I'm at the top of the tree, regardless of where I am, I'm reducing the number of nodes that need to be counted every time. I'm splitting the problem into two pieces, but those pieces don't actually add up to the whole problem because I've already counted myself. So every step of this algorithm counts one node, unless, I've, unless I'm here in which I'm counting zero nodes. So I'm making the problem smaller, and then I'm combining the results from my recursive calls. So 
Uh, we saw two ways of doing that. In the first way, I did it using some if statements because I didn't want to, I was trying to avoid calling it on a null reference. But in the second case, I could do it in that one line. Right, so I have this single line that is combining the results from these calls together. This is probably by far the simplest case of recursive call combination. There are times when you need to call a recursive function in a tree or on a graph on one group of nodes and then actually do something with the result that's more complicated than this. But this is a simple case. Good for getting started. Okay. So let's go back and look at factorial and let's try to identify these steps because I just want to make you sure you understand that this is a technique that's not confined to trees. So what's the base case in my, this factorial, recursive factorial implementation? When do I stop? Where's the place where I don't call myself again? Or I don't keep recursing? One. Once I reach one, I solve the problem immediately. I don't need to compute a smaller, I don't need to create a smaller problem. Okay? What's the recursive step? I decrement n. So with the tree, I'm making the problem smaller by reducing the number of nodes that I have to finish. Here, I'm making the problem smaller by actually reducing the size of the number that I'm trying to compute factorial for. So I start off with trying to compute factorial for a big number, and then at every step, I'm making the number smaller and smaller and smaller. Combine the results. Here, I'm multiplying my current value with the value of the factorial of the next smallest number. So that's just the definition of factorial. How you combine results together depends a lot on the subproblem, on the particular problem that you're trying to solve, the particular algorithm that you're trying to solve. Okay? One thing that's important, so I can already foresee what we're gonna find on the forum and in office hours over the next couple weeks, which is my program did not complete in the time allotted. You're gonna hit timeout errors in our test cases when you're working on your recursive functions for MP5. Why? Because you didn't get to a base case. You have to. If you don't, you've created an unending chain of activity that will never stop until Java says, you know what, forget this. Like, I am not doing this anymore. Clearly, whatever you're trying to do is broken. And that will happen pretty quickly, actually. So this particular piece of code has a problem. How can it fail to reach a base case? Yeah. Yeah, what if I started on like zero? All right. So what happens if I call this with negative four? So it says, okay, is it one? No, then I don't know what to do. So I'm gonna try to make the problem smaller. So I'm gonna take negative four times the result of calling factorial on negative five. Is negative five one? No. Well, I know how to make the problem smaller. I'm gonna call, uh, you know, multiply the result of, and multiply negative five with the result of calling factorial on negative six. This will just never end. If you run this in IntelliJ, you can print off the numbers as you go. In our little script runner, we can't do that, but you can see that this is going to fail. What's happening here is Eventually, this program runs so long, consumes so much memory, that Java says something is wrong, and it will, it will, your program will get killed. It will end. Like I said, this is, and this is the thing that can be very frustrating about recursive programs. When you don't reach a base case and you're not exactly quite sure why, uh, it can be very difficult to debug, because your program can spew an enormous amount of output. It's not clear exactly what the problem is. Okay, great. One thing I want, I want to point out here, um, and you know, we're about to give you a big chunk of practice with recursion. Recursion is a technique that has deep mathematical roots. It can be, some, there are some people that consider it to be quite elegant, beautiful, um, but there are times when recursive solutions can be tricky to wrap your mind around. And it's not always the right solution to every problem. Your goal as a beginning programmer and computer scientist is clarity above all else. Clarity above mastery of a particular technique, clarity above concision in terms of the number of lines of code, clarity, period. That is your goal. Writing clear, elegant solutions to problems that other people can understand, that you can understand, that somebody can help you with. 
That's, that is our objective. If an iterative solution is more clear or more intuitive to you, then use it. Recursion is not a technique to be applied in order to impress people, um, or whatever. Um, don't use recursion because you're like, oh, I know recursion is the solution to that, right? In many cases, the iterative solution is also more efficient. Um, you know, there's been a lot of work in language design to try to make certain types of recursive programs more efficient in order to satisfy these math geeks that want to write recursive solutions for everything, right? Uh, but in general, there are cases where iterative solutions are much nicer. And here's one of them, in my opinion, um, which is factorial. Here is factorial. There is no need to write a recursive version of factorial. It's a loop. It's not that hard. Okay, so, so again, you know, some of you are, might be drawn to that recursive implementation. Some of you feel like this makes a lot more sense. Do what works for you. Um, but don't, you know, again, we're not teaching you recursion for it to seem cool. The problems that you're gonna solve on MP5, on the other hand, are cases where recursion is very much the right way to approach these problems. Um, also, really anything on trees. One of the reasons that we use trees so heavily in this class when we talk about recursion is that trees are a great fit for this particular problem solving strategy. All right, let's talk about add, okay? So the code that we gave you has a recursive implementation of add that sticks nodes in the tree. So I just wanna walk through that as our second example of a recursive function. So if I start off with a tree that has one node and I want to add nodes to it, the first thing I do is I essentially say, in the current tree, if it's missing either a left child or a right child, then I'm gonna add the node there. So these are simple cases. Essentially, when I get to a particular node in the tree, I fill that node first. So I make sure it has a left and a right child. Until it has a left or a right child, I'm not going to go any farther. But now I have a case where I'm trying to add a fourth node. And the question becomes, how do I do this? So here, what I say is, so, you know, I'm not sure exactly how to add the node to this tree because it's already got two children. So it's a different example of how to make the problem smaller. So essentially what I do is I say, there's no room at this node, but I bet if I go down and I choose a smaller subset of the tree, then I can finally find a tree that has, uh, a node that has no children or has only one child. I can find a place for this new node. And so what our code that does adds on the tree does is it randomly picks one of the subtrees, and this is to try to keep the tree balanced. If I always pick the right subtree, I would essentially end up with a very linear tree, so I randomly pick one or the other. And then I restart my add algorithm on that tree, on the tree rooted at that node. Every subtree of a tree is a tree. So now if I'm adding the fourth node, I have a, I have a home for it. Um, if I'm adding the fifth node, I'm gonna start it again at node five. I'm gonna randomly choose one of three or 10. If I choose three, it needs both children. So I'm gonna keep doing this. Eventually, my second level of the tree will also be full. And then my add algorithm will recurse deeper into the tree to find a node that has space. So again, what I'm doing here is I'm essentially making the problem smaller by saying, there's no room right at the top of this tree, so I'll pick a random subtree and there's probably room down there. Eventually, if I keep doing that, I'm gonna get to a leaf, right? And a leaf has to have room for a new node. That's the definition of a leaf. It doesn't have any children. So even if every single one of its parents has two children, I have a completely full tree above it, a leaf node has space for more. All right, so this is already in the code we gave you. All right, so I'm, we're, we're getting to the point where I kind of want to stop. Let's talk about one more problem, and maybe what we'll do is we'll leave this for homework on Monday, or maybe we'll do it quickly together. Because this, this problem actually, uh, we probably won't completely get through, because this requires us to do a little bit more thinking. So let's write an algorithm that basically does the following. So I want to find, I have a tree. Tree has values in it and I want to find the number of nodes where the value of the node's right child is greater than the value of the node's left child. All right? 
So how am I going to do this? Hey, guys. Can I talk? Thanks. How am I going to do this? What is our recursive algorithm? Think about this for a minute. What's our base case? What's the point at which we have to solve the problem? Yeah. Yeah, okay, good question. Yeah, so, so I haven't fully specified the problem. What should we do if the node only has one child? or another child, I'm gonna say, let's just ignore that node. I only want to compute the number of nodes where the node has both children, and one of them is greater than the other. Yeah. Nope. No assumptions about the tree. It's possible that I could call this on a tree where no node has both children. Right? But remember how trees work. It's also possible that I have a tree where I have a bunch, bunch of nodes that only have one child, and then right at the bottom, I've got a node that has two children. So I can't stop. So if I've reached a tree with one node, this is another case where I'm gonna recurse all the way down to the leaves. Once I've re reached a tree with only one node, or we can also do this where I've, I've walked off the tree, I've gotten to a null reference, that Node, a leaf node, does not have a right or left child, and therefore it doesn't have a right child that's greater than its left child, so this is a case where I can return zero, okay? What do I do to make the problem smaller? This is the thing that I almost always do on trees. How do I make the problem smaller at every step? I don't want to compute the whole problem all at once. Instead, I want to make it slightly smaller. How do I do that? Essentially the same thing I did with count, yeah. Yep, I compute the result for myself. So I've taken, I've computed one node, and then I add the number of nodes that have this property in my right tree to the number of nodes that have this property in my left tree. So the structure of this starts to look very similar to count, except in this case, I'm using a property of the node. How do I combine the results together? I kind of just explained that. I compute the result for myself. So if I have a right and left child, then I add one to the total. Otherwise, I don't count myself, and I just return the number of nodes in my right subtree that have this property plus the number of nodes in my left subtree that have this property. Okay. Yeah. No, yeah, so, so the question is, can I subtract one subtree? No, because it's, you know, because I, what I really want is a count. I'm never gonna subtract here, right? You know, I, I always, th this is a property of every node that has two children, right? So either the node has it or it doesn't have it. I never want to remove nodes from this sum. It's a good question. Okay, so this is a fun chance to review some of the concepts we just talked about. What's wrong with this tree implementation? What's the first thing that I'm gonna have to fix about this before I can even start this problem? Somebody is gonna notice this. I can't even start working on this problem yet, because my tree class has a problem. It doesn't support this yet, why not? What's wrong with it? it seems like it's a perfectly fine tree class. Every node stores an object and then has references to a right and left node. What's wrong here? Yeah, no, I, no, this is fine because this class is only gonna be used inside that, so I can access it from the parent. So that's a good question, yeah. So the, the comment was, it looks like my inner class has private members, but those can still be accessed from the enclosing class. That's a good, good point. There's something fundamentally wrong with this. Yeah.
Yeah, so the first problem is not going, is not gonna happen because of how we construct the tree. But the second observation is correct. So what's wrong with just, remember, I'm looking for nodes where my right child is greater than my left child. What do I have to do to make this tree compatible with that goal? Right now it stores objects, which again is very general purpose. Yeah. Bingo. So we talked, we did all this talking about having you guys use and implement interfaces. Here's a place where that's gonna come in handy. I can't compare two objects together in Java. If I just have an object in Java, there's no notion of it being greater or less than another object. So I can't even implement this. I have to go through, take this entire class, and rewrite it so that it stores objects that are comparable. This is gonna turn out to be extremely important as we continue to work on trees, particularly once we start to talk about searching trees. And so that's something that I will do over the weekend and we will pick up here on Monday. All right. So I wanna talk for four minutes about the final project fair. So, it's our second final project fair this semester. Last semester's was fantastic. It was really incredible. Um, this semester, it'll be bigger and better than ever. It'll definitely be bigger because there's more of you, uh, better because you're getting experience at how to do this. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about the logistics because I want to start putting this on your calendar and kind of getting it in your mind. So we hold this on reading day. Reading day is Thursday, December 13th. It's the day after classes end. Why do we do this? Well, you guys are free on reading day, and particularly this semester, by the time we get to reading day, you will be done with everything for this class except this fair, if you choose to participate. We do not have an exam. You will have finished the last midterm. That's gonna be the weekend before. We'll have, cl I don't, we'll have class on Monday and Wednesday. I'm not sure why. We'll probably just hang out and play loud music or whatever. Um, but, you know, we'll talk about some cool stuff. But essentially, you're done. I have gifted you with all this time to prepare for your finals and all of your other stupid classes, okay? What I'm taking in return, if you want, is a couple hours of your time on reading day to participate in this fair, which is fantastic. So it is not required. There are no required activities on reading day. It is optional, but it's worth 1% extra credit if you participate, all right? We need a bigger space this year. Last year we did this in Siebel. This year we're probably gonna get the union, some of the large space in there, and then we'll do awards and announcements afterwards in here in Follinger. All right, so this is, this is really a really fun event. I would encourage you guys to do it. Here's why we do this. Some of you are just starting out in this field, so let me give you some advice about how to get a not great CS job, because there are not great CS jobs out there. I hate to break that to you. Somebody has to maintain Clippy, okay? And all sorts of other stupid features of crappy products that everyone is frustrated by. Those are good jobs, but they're not great jobs. Here's how to not get a good job in computer science. Take CS classes and do really well in them. Get good grades, do the projects, do the 225 MPs, get, you know, perfect scores on them, whatever. Do all the 125 homework, you know, write malloc for 241, and then you're gonna go talk to an employer and it's like, who are you? There's hundreds of other students that did those things. And of course, don't get involved in anything on the side because it might impact your grades. And those are absolutely important. If you do this, you will get a job. I guarantee it, you're one of the top CS programs in the country. You will get a job. It will not be a great job. So how do you get a great job? Show your passion for technology. Show what you can do. Show how you can do creative, individual, exciting things. Show that you can learn. Show that you have picked up skills outside of class because you're excited about this, because this is something you want to do. This is our first attempt to get you started down this path. What you do for the final project is totally up to you. The grading is very generous. Some of you will do the minimum. Some of you will do incredible things. So I wanna show you, so there's a page up, I'll send this out in a link later, of links to final projects that people did last year for the final project fair. I wish I had a little bit more time. I might send out a link to one of these later. So one of the projects from last semester, for example, 
was that there were students that were bothered by our attendance taking system. And so they built an app that watches the slides and figures out when slide transitions occur. I'm serious. We actively supported development of this tool. I had a lot of conversations about them about how to do it. I actually think you could actually pick up that app and do a much better job of it. Um, so this is the type of thing, this is what's gonna get you a job. And this is what's gonna get you more excited and more passionate about this field. All right, we will have more about this soon. As a reminder, MEMB5 will be out Monday morning. I have my usual office hours today. I will see you guys on Monday. Enjoy a weekend off. <laughs>